Welcome, Irish fans, to this week's edition of the Jack Swarbrick Show. On today's show, Jack Swarbrick and I will talk about the Notre Dame football program. We will chat with one of the best goalies in college hockey, Cal Peterson, and we'll visit with Notre Dame head track and field coach Alan Turner to talk about the indoor track and field season getting underway Friday. First, to get things started, we're going to talk about the subject that everybody is talking about, Jack. That, of course, is the Notre Dame football program. I know both you and Coach Kelly made statements after the USC game that apparently no one's paying any attention to. And there have been some articles since that time. So lots of rumors out there that right now you and Coach Kelly are negotiating a buyout to relieve him of his duties, that some of the Board of Trustees want to change, that Coach Kelly himself is looking for a new job. Is there any truth to any of this? Uh, no, but we're happy to do our part to provide entertainment for for everyone who uh, who's, who's been engaged in all of that, um, I certainly understand the, the the sort of the the engagement and the the discussion of the program. But it's been very much business as usual. Um, we have a whole series of things we do at the end of the year. Uh, we conduct exit interviews with every senior. Um, we do some statistical analysis. Uh, Coach Kelly is meeting with every member of the team uh, over a three-day period to talk to them. Obviously, he meets with staff. Then he and I come together at the end of that process to, to sit down and, and talk about what's, what we need to change, what's next, what the plans are for the upcoming year. So in that sense, it's been absolutely business as usual from our perspective. Now, clearly this year was a step back. No one is happy about that. Before that, there had been a consistent level of success, a bowl game every year, but not enough success for some. There are those that believe that a wall's been hit and that a change needs to happen. Why do you think Coach Kelly is the man to continue to lead the program? Well, um, let me start by saying I, I agree completely with your premise. It was an extremely disappointing year. Um, every player, every coach, myself, um, other administrators involved in the program, uh, we all share the same view. Um, there's, no, uh, there's no way around that conclusion. It's not bad breaks. It's not a play here, play there. We didn't, we didn't do what we, what we need to do, and so we, we do start from that perspective. But I think there's a danger in overreacting to any one piece of information that you get in the course of evaluating football programs. And so that begins with, it looks one way from a this season perspective, but it feels a little different for me from a two season perspective. I thought last year was one of the best coaching jobs I have seen. And I've been around elite level coaches for 35 years now. I think to achieve what we achieved with the things we faced last year in terms of the, the attrition of our roster, which was like nothing I'd ever seen before, I thought it was a really remarkable uh, uh, year as reflected in the contributions that the players and coaches collectively made to achieve that year. This year we get a different result and you know you don't ignore it. You, you certainly evaluate it and, and pay a lot of attention to it but I don't look at it in isolation. I look at it in, in the context of where the program is overall. Wins and losses are critically important to us. We are in this to win and uh, we are we are never going to shy away from that standard. But I also have all kinds of additional information by virtue of the fact that I'm around the program every day. And I've said this publicly many times, but uh, for all the disappointment of this season, this was one of the more remarkable teams in terms of its identity that I have been around. Uh, no matter how difficult this season was, this team led by James and others demonstrated a, a, a bond and, and an approach to the game and an enthusiasm and a willingness to practice and a relationship with the coaches that is what, that is what you want to see in a program. So uh, that's, not a, that's not a substitute for winning, but it's, it is among the other things I look at. Now, there are those that believe that off-field issues culminating in the announcement last week of the one-year probation from the NCAA, the, the $5,000 fine, and most importantly, uh, which I know you were fighting, but being told to vacate 21 victories, which really damages Notre Dame's football legacy, that all of that combined with the season's 4-8 and eight record provides a very good case to make a change. Well, you know, I, I, I understand why people say that. I, I draw a different conclusion. And I think it's important to note that while that felt like news publicly, 
I had all that information. I mean, we, we the, the the nature of this NCA proceeding was that you you agree to the underlying allegations and and the fact basis. The only thing that was at issue was the penalty. So in midseason, when I made the comment I did about Brian's future, I already had that information. This isn't something new coming in late in the season that 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 I have to factor in. I I, I knew it. Substantively, two two things in response to that. One is the university's uh, view on the appropriateness of uh, the ruling. We've stated in publicly, and it's not it's not Jack Swarbrick, it's not athletics. The university thinks uh, the approach here was wrong. We're going to appeal it, and we're going to appeal it principally because uh, not because of the loss of f- football victories, but because we we believe. It's inconsistent with the academic autonomy that a university ought to have, and 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 that's the issue here. So, uh, for, for 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 that reason, um, it's not that we don't ignore the situation in any way, but we also don't believe that outcome was was correct. And on the other hand, we're incredibly disappointed any time somebody, some young person at this university chooses to act in a manner which is inconsistent with our with our honor code. But the fundamental nature of this place is we hold those people responsible, all right? I mean, no one, no one's looking to somebody else here and saying they have unique responsibility. There was the NCAA opinion makes clear there was no institutional actor here involved. There was no coach who knew something. There was no academic advisor who knew something, and 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 so you you can't ascribe everything that an individual does to his rector or his coach or his professor. Um, they're, they're young adults and they make decisions. We give them the best guidance we can, but I don't, I don't extrapolate from it um, that there's been some failure inside the football program. And, and as you appeal, and, and as long as I've been covering college athletics, the issue has always been the NCAA has no real subpoena power. They can call you in and ask you questions, but they can't compel you to be truthful. The university went beyond the initial reports of academic malfeasance to do a complete investigation to see where it led, how widespread it might be, wasn't that widespread, and turned over all that information to the NCAA and then gets severely penalized. So is part of this maybe, I think it's a chilling effect on other schools. See what happens if you go ahead and do this. You could have summarily just dismissed some players and we wouldn't be talking about this right now. Well, that's that's one of the... Uh the ironies and, and, and we think an, an unintended consequence of this to to have a ruling uh, the extension of which is had you merely expelled the students you wouldn't get this penalty but because you went through an educative process and kept them in school and and adjusted credits and made those things you subject you subjected yourself to this penalty that that seems like a bad message to send but 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 that's one of that will continue to to advocate for uh, down the road. I, I do think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, the, the, while, while, we don't, while we don't like the conclusions drawn about what the sanctions should be, that the NCAA was fairly laudatory about everything Notre Dame did here. Every, every actor involved from the first moment on through the conclusion of this process did exactly what the university would hope they would do. Now we are taping this in our normal day and time, Wednesday night, November 30th. When is the last time you've spoken with Coach Kelly? Yesterday. Uh, we, had, we didn't speak today, but in part it's because of that process that we go through. Um, and we will spend time together, a significant amount of time together at the end of this week, as we always do. Again, I want to I stress it's the normal process as we both bring the pieces of information we're collecting together and uh, focus on – on every aspect of the program. There's nothing we don't look at um, in these year-end reviews. Now, you know fans are wondering, did you ask him if he is looking for another job? Um, we talked about it. I don't, I don't want to I don't wanna make it sound like I didn't know the answer to that. I, I, I did know mm-hmm. the answer to that. We, we had a discussion on the night after the game um, when, the, when the reports came out, and I was sort of – I fully understood the background of those reports and Brian and I had had clear discussions about his intentions and his future. And of course he clarified those, I think both at the press conference after the game and then in the subsequent uh, statement that went out under Michael's account. So there is no question in your mind 
that right now he is fully focused on returning next year, without question. Oh, that's right. And let's let's take that a, a little bit bigger because this is a high stakes game, major college football coaching. Uh, back in 2012, he did explore an NFL option just to see if he'd even be interested in it, which I think is natural. All these coaches have agents, and it is the agent's job to maintain as many options as possible for their clients, even if they are not on a daily basis saying, hey, I check this, I check that, I check this. Um, so we talked a little bit beforehand. You're not necessarily – all that concerned if someone's agent whose chief goal and chief responsibility is to make sure that he always puts all options on the table for his client uh, continues to do that up to a point. Yeah, what I, what I want is the information. We have very successful coaches here across our programs who from time to time get opportunities and explore them. I don't have any problem with that. Um, now, again, I want to stress, I don't think that's happening uh, at the moment. I'm confident it's not. But, yeah, that doesn't, that, that, that never bothers me. And um, I just want, I want to know that I'm fully, fully informed. Um, and sometimes, as your question suggests, it really doesn't involve the coach. It involves the coach's representative doing what representatives do. I'm not going to go into the details of what was reported here and what version of, of that I think that it is, or I know it to be here. But, but, but the point is, it, uh, it, it, it's, you know, on both sides, both what agents do and what coaches report to me are, are pretty normal course of business. You are not just the director of athletics here. You're the vice president, a vice president of the university. You're an officer of the university. Have you gotten any pressure from the board of trustees in terms of Coach Kelly's future? No, no, it doesn't work that way here. I mean, I know people like to write about it that way. Every, every, every coaching issue around the country, somebody will write, you know, a group of boosters or trustees have gotten together and are going to pay for the buyout and all that. Just that's not how Notre Dame operates. Um, Father Jenkins is the CEO of this enterprise, and he is – firmly in control of everything that goes on here. I have an athletic affairs committee of the board of trustees that has a chairman that I see counsel of and spend time with. And the communication all sits there. The only people I'm ever likely to talk to about business issues are Father Jenkins, John F. I. Graves, the executive vice president of the university, the chair of the board of trustees, or my, the chair of my advisory council, or uh, the athletic affairs committee. Um, that's it. Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't happen otherwise. You and Coach Kelly are meeting again on Friday. Uh, he himself has said there'll be some staff changes made. What kinds of changes do you think need to be made, or is that a question you need to answer after that meeting on Friday? Oh, you know, I I, I certainly have some views, um, but I'm not going to discuss those publicly. I mean, Brian and I'll talk, share share our views. We've already done done a lot of that um, in in communication this week. But um, you know, I, I think we got we have a very talented staff of committed coaches um, and broader staff in the program. So I'm, I don't I don't anticipate wholesale changes. We obviously have a a decision to make relative to the defensive coordinator, and and a lot. A lot of the other things will flow from that decision. Some may smile watching and listening to this, but one thing I've noticed with Coach Kelly and observing him closely since he arrived here is he is somewhat flexible for a head football coach in the way he does things, in some of his strategies, and in some of the way he uses players. Because a lot of people have this image that he's absolutely rigid. But that said, are there things that you think need to be done in terms of changing the way the programs run right now? Or does that fall in the same category of the last question? It, it does, but I would say there's never, there hasn't been a year where I haven't had that view. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, what you, it, it's part of the self-evaluation. Uh, when we were 12-0 and 0 and went to the national championship game, I had views about things uh, th that I thought we ought to consider doing differently, and, and, and we will have those this year. Again, it's not out of the norm. It's, it's done in the context of a more disappointing uh, season, and the most, uh, many ways the most disappointing since I've been here. Um, but the, the, the analysis and the process doesn't change. So the most disappointing since you've been here, but in the big picture, 
bad year, but it's not indicative of where the program is heading. Yeah, that's uh, that, that, that's the point I always try and make in these conversations, that I'm looking at the program. Wins and losses are a huge indicia of where the program is, but it it's not it's not the only one. More important to me, frankly, is the experience of our students and and my interaction with them and what their relationships are with the coaches and what the environment is for them and are we meeting our their expectations. Now, we clearly didn't meet their expectations competitively this year because they want to win too. But on many of the other things, you know, I, I'm – the program elements are in good shape. I don't want to do anything to minimize the disappointments, whether they're competitive or, you know, unacceptable behavior in the last game at USC by, by one of our players, obviously, which just isn't, is not acceptable. Isn't okay. Um, you know, the, the disciplinary issues we had to deal with at the front end of the year. Uh, none of those things are acceptable. All of those go into the evaluation, but those are the only ones that sort of get the public scrutiny, right? I'm I'm dealing with the other 120 young men who are, for the most part, like my co-host James, doing everything right, making every right decision, having a really positive experience, and and you gotta you gotta look at it all, not just isolated elements of it. You're a class of '77 graduate. I got on '76, '76, '76. I got onto. Uh, campus in 82 uh, and this is a much different university now than it was then it was very good then thanks for pointing out you're younger than me go ahead <laughs> but you look younger than I do uh, now it's elite it's one of the top 20 universities period in the country number one undergraduate business school in the country is it harder now in this environment it's been 28 years since Notre Dame's won the national championship in football is it harder now that is still the goal and I don't even want to forward that. No one's taking that off the table. But is it harder to have that success now than it was 30 years ago? You know, I, I think undoubtedly it is harder. Um, now, you know, people from that era may have a, may have a different view. But there, there are things that make it harder. Uh, that it's, but it doesn't make any difference, right? It, it's, it's harder to win basketball games. Than it than it was back then, um, it's harder to do a number of things. But uh, that we don't we don't treat any of that uh, as a as an excuse or reason to have different goals. And so um, I I sort of embrace that. It's what just it's some of those things that you might view as obstacles are ultimately the things we have to offer young people. It is the eliteness of the institution and the quality of the education. Um, and and so you you can't you can't say it's an obstacle and then talk about how great it is because it helps you and and that's that's the way it is i wouldn't trade anything for the the circumstance we now compete in i think it is exactly what it should be we have to do a better job with it that's all every coach who has been hired to be the head coach here since lou holtz left to now had had significant success at some level at the major college level at some level somewhere else why do you think that right now, uh, at this point, through that 28-year period from the time Notre Dame last won uh, the title, and I guess we should go move it up to when Coach Holtz left, that this program is closer and continues to get back to the level where everyone on this campus, everyone involved with the university wants it to be, and that is to win another national championship? Well, I, 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 can't, I can't say – that it's closer today than it was this day last year. But I think the pieces are all there. And, you know, again, that's what I focus on. Do we, do we have sort of institutional obstacles, environmental obstacles that are going to keep us from getting there? And, and I just don't think we do. I think, I think we can absolutely uh, uh, achieve that goal again. And frankly, the current program has offered that evidence. If, if there's one thing that bothers me about the analysis, it's the discount, discounting of getting to the national championship game. The results of that game were not what we wanted. It was, it, was, it was a bad performance, and every player who participated in it will, will, will tell you that they were disappointed in the performance. But going from that bad performance in that game 
to a discounting of the entire season that got us to that game, I, I just don't subscribe to. This coach, this program has been to a national championship game. Last year, under extraordinary circumstances, they, they were positioned to be in the playoff again. Um, the last three weeks didn't, didn't help us get there. Um, and we, you know, so that was the consequence of it. We were right in, right in the mix. And, and so we've offered our own evidence that you can do it. Um, I would argue Stanford's offered pretty compelling evidence that you can compete at that level. So um, the pieces are there. We've demonstrated that they're there. Uh, we just have to fix what we didn't get right this year and move on. You know that Brian's going to have to deal with next year that his seat is hot. That's what everybody's going to be talking about. So what has to happen next year for this team to have a successful enough season to eat, that you are comfortable that this regime continues beyond next year? No, oh, I'm, not, I'm not heading down that road. You know, I think that's, that's – uh, there, there, there is no standard. There is no saying it has to be this because you don't know the circumstances of the year. I mean – You've you've seen programs that lose three quarterbacks in a single in a single season, right? Well, that would have that would have an impact on your evaluation. So there's no magic number. There's no magic outcome. I'll engage in the same process next year that I engaged in this year, and and the same analysis. I I, I may be much much less likely to say anything next year publicly because when I said it this year, I I, I it came back and bit me in the butt. And so uh, I'm I'm probably not inclined to ever comment again on a coach's status. But I think that's an important answer because, you know, every, many observers will try to do that at the beginning of the year. Many have discounted some of the circumstances of the prior two seasons because the season before last had what we thought was an incredible number of injuries before it was surpassed last season. Right. So these are all factors that, that are involved in how you evaluate this program. Is there anything else out there, any report you've seen, any email you have received, uh, any text or comment, uh, that you feel compelled at this point that you would like to answer? No, other than to say, um, as challenging as it can be, I do read all those things. Um, I, um, I, 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 uh, I wish there was a little greater civility in some of them, but um, the point is every one of those communications is fueled by a passion for the program and a love of the university. And that's our greatest asset. And, and so I do care about, uh, about those views and what people think. They don't affect my view because I have to look at the objective information of every element of the program, not just one. And I'll continue to do that. But, uh, you know, no one, no one should think that uh, we, we, we don't understand the mood or don't pay attention to what people say. We do. We care about it. But my obligation to our students in every sport is to evaluate the program in terms of its ability to meet our three commitments to those students. Maximize their athletic growth, maximize their intellectual growth, and maximize their personal growth. That's the business we're in, and that's how we evaluate our programs. So we've had a lengthy discussion. So the bottom line is, right now, you think that retaining uh, Coach Kelly and, and much of the current staff and the way things are done with improvements to make them better – are better than the alternative, which is starting again, which is something I don't think people understand how difficult that is. Yeah, the only thing I'd say in response to that is uh, I, I'd sort of take the right now out of that. I expressed that view two months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you don't express that view uh, unless you've made an evaluation and made a decision. I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't saying it cavalierly. When, when you make that, you've got to say, what if the rest of the season doesn't get better? Am I still prepared to have this be my answer? And, and there was, you know, I, I know there was some media frustration that I wouldn't address this topic again. I'm not doing that. I did address it, and I addressed it publicly. And I, I did that with careful consideration. As I said, I knew the NCAA information. I didn't make any assumptions about the year getting better competitively. So I, I, I had the information then uh, that I needed. And um, if you get in the business of then reaffirming it every week, you, you create an untenable situation. And so that's why I let my statement stand. I wasn't, I wasn't avoiding giving anyone an answer on this topic. I had given the answer. And the passion of those fans that you talk about, much of it's very visible on social media. So for those now who are actively on standby for a coming announcement or change, they can stand down. 
they should just be rooting for Notre Dame basketball right now. To uh, two great undefeated teams, and I hope all that passion and energy goes towards uh, towards ro- rooting our basketball teams onto a really successful season. I know I'm enjoying that, Jack. Thank you very much. We're going to come back, we get our student athletes in here, and Cal Peterson, one of the best goalies in the country, will be joining us here on the Jack Swarbrick Show. I play because I love it. The enjoyment, and excitement you get when you play. Whenever we go out and play a home game, I know to expect at least 8,000 people. It really just pumps me up. It's an unreal feeling just knowing that everyone's there to watch you do what you love. 